This is Brian Warmers. I'm recording a lecture for pediatric nursing and specifically for musculoskeletal or articular dysfunction. Some of the objectives we'll talk about immobilization of a child. We'll talk about uh, traumatic musculoskeletal injuries. We're going to be talking about teaching plans for parents um, that have a child in a cast. We'll explain the function of traction. We'll talk about DDH, uh, clubfoot, osteogenesis imperfecta, leg cap Hurley's disease, and skiffy. We'll talk about scoliosis. We'll talk about osteomyelitis. And then we'll talk about tumor, septic joint, JIA, uh, and SLE. So first, immobility. Immobility is very hard on all types of patients and um, usually has an increased risk of morbidity and mortality associated with it. Specifically, some of the ways that this can impact the kid is with their muscular system, they're going to have decreased strength, decreased mobility, decreased endurance. With their skeletal system, demineralization, decreased calcium stores. With metabolism, they'll have a decreased metabolic rate. With cardiovascular system, they'll have some venous stasis, can lead into clots. We'll have some edema and some distribution issues with the blood. With the respiratory system, they'll have decreased lung capacity and diaphragm strength. With gastrointestinal system, they'll have some feeding difficulties, stooling difficulties, and possibly some anorexia. With the integumentary system, decreased circulation, pressure uh, to the skin, possibly causing ulcerations. The urinary system, difficult to avoid when, it, when you're laying in bed. And then some psychological things. And they might regress a little bit. They have some altered perceptions. And often they get kind of frustrated in bed. So traumatic injury can be lots of different things. Uh, we can talk about the tendon. We can talk about bones. We can talk about ligaments. We can talk about the joint. We can talk about um, bruising. We can talk about um, all sorts of things. Um, usually initial treatment for this is going to include rice. So with these, with rice, you know, we're talking about rest, ice, compress, elevate, and then support. For dislocations, um, you can reduce it and do a subluxation with this. This is one of my favorite procedures. Um, you can watch this video and kind of see how it's done. But basically, uh, rotate the hand, supinate it, and then bring the hand up towards the shoulder, and hopefully it pops back into place. Fractures, this is very common in children. There's many different treatment methods for, um, many treatments for this, but um, we have to be very careful with kids, especially if we're talking about um, bone growth and those growth plates. So that's a major concern in pediatrics. So different types of fractures include clothes. So this is non-displaced and closed, so it's together and it's sticking inside of the body. Open means it's coming outside of the body. Comminuted, you get little fragments of this. This is usually a crush injury. Displaced means that it's broken and it's not lined up. You get an oblique, so it goes diagonal. You can get a spiral fracture, so there's some kind of a rotational injury on this. You can get impacted, so compression once again. So if this was like a leg bone, you can kind of think about falling. Um, and then green stick. So green stick is what it says it is. If you were to go out, find a, a stick that was on the ground and it's not real dry and hard and brittle, um, it's green. You try to break it, it'll break part of the way through and then it tends to go up. In kids, this is very common to have a green stick, green stick fracture. Um, and so it's very common to see. So speaking of fractures, uh, my daughter fell off of a scooter one time and fractured her wrist. Take a few moments, see if you can figure out where this is at. Um, you are not expected to be able to read x-rays as a nurse, but it is kind of fun. So, just a hint, it's right here. And you can kind of see that calcification right there, and just a little fragment where it's not quite smooth and even. Alright, so healing really quick in neonates. And then it pro prolongs and gets longer as people get older. Please remember your five P's. On testing, I'm only going to mention five. I know if there's six or seven, there's eight. But make sure that you understand these. Um, 
For the exam, Pallor will only have two L's instead of three. Casting. Cast can be lots of different things. We can make it out of fiberglass, plaster, or plastic. Um, some advantages for, for fiberglass is that it's lighter weight by a little bit. It dries quickly. It hardens quickly. Um, it does create some sharp edges, which is kind of a negative thing with this. Uh, a positive thing, maybe in the pediatric realm, is that it comes in different colors. And so we can have some fun with that. And I've seen you know, candy striped ones around the holidays or um, school colors with different, you know, two different colors or, you know, rainbow. Um, but that it doesn't make it all better, but it sometimes can help. Plaster cast, we sometimes see that for like hip dysplasias, and we'll, we'll talk about that here in a little bit. It's not common for pretty much anything else. Um, bad thing about this, it does... Um, take a long time for it to dry. And so it can stay wet and fairly malleable for hours and, and maybe even days. Um, and within that time period, that, that child is, is vulnerable to hurting themselves again. And it's not real good support. Some places are starting to do 3D printing of casts like this. Nice advantages of it. It is open, it's airy, it still provides support. But you're not going to get the complications of the fiber and the plastic cast where you have sweat build up underneath here, you have dead skin build up, and it itches, and it smells gross, and stuff like that. So this is sometimes a nice alternative, uh, but not every place is offering this one yet. Um, pedaling the cast, if, if you ever hear about pedaling, so basically on the plaster cast and the fiberglass cast, the edges are kind of rough, and so we'll take some mole skin, which is a special type of tape, and just kind of cover around the outside of it to cover that sharp edge to make sure it doesn't cut the patient. Cast care, so for the fiberglass and the plaster, usually we say we can't go swimming or do those kind of things, get it wet. There are some fiberglass casts that are quote unquote waterproof. Um, the hard thing about it though is the outside layer might be, but hopefully the inside layer is as well. Um, that wet cast padding is kind of gross if that happens. Um, but just try and take care of it. And then if it does itch, don't scratch it. And I know that that's going to be hard, but I've seen kids use everything from steak knives to coat hangers to reach inside the cast and, and scratch an itch. So if they start bleeding or they cut themselves, that, that's hard to stop. Cast removal. Look at that cutter. That Most people think that that cutter um, is a circular saw and it goes around in a circle and spins and will cut anything. But honestly, all it does is vibrate back and forth really rapidly. Um, so make sure that you educate your patients well on this one. Um, probably show them by touching your hand, making sure that, you know, it, 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 show them that it doesn't hurt and won't cut them. Traction. We really don't use a lot of traction anymore, but NCLEX still likes to test on some of this stuff, especially Bucks traction. So Bucks traction is a Velcro boot that you place on somebody. Um, there's no pins, there's no outside sources with this, but then you have straps on here and then a rope that's connected to weights on the end of the bed. And what it does is with traction, it pulls. It pulls this this way and this this way um, related to your body weight. And then you're trying to separate the bones so that they can grow in a nice straight line. Cervical traction kind of does the same stuff. You're trying to separate the vertebrae uh, and so you don't get impingement on the nerves. And so you get this wonderful halo um, around your head. This gets bolted into the skull. And then you wear this brace. It's got the uh, titanium bars that are here to hold you in place and then lift up and kind of separate those out. Um, cervical traction or cervical tongues um, can be done in this fanner, manner. So you've got um, your rope going down to weights and such like that. Very uncommon um, anymore to see this. With this, uh, if you're using traction, make sure that you know the amount of weight that uh, will be a prescribed thing from the provider. Make sure that it's constant. Uh, you can't change that. You can't adjust that without a specialized order. Uh, be careful. Kids are sneaky. They'll sneak down to the edge of the bed, or they'll try and sneak far enough down so that the weight is resting on the ground. So... Just make sure you're watching that and make sure that the weight is freely pulling that leg um, and that it's, you know, what 
the way that the doctor ordered. Moving on to DDH, so this incidence is one per uh, 100. Uh, this is a hip abnormality, and this is the one that you commonly see when they're checking for uh, the hip click. So they'll do the Ortolani and then the Barlow test. Um, you'll feel a clunk with that. So if you do that or if you see them do that in like maternal, um, you might see it with young kids and peds. But what happens is you kind of get this shallow acetabulum uh, and then it sublux, so it pops out, dislocates. Um, so with that, it, it pops back in, and so that's the these different tests. How you might notice this, on little kids you might see one limb that's shorter than the other. You might see different gluteal folds, so the little butt cheeks will little, look a little different. Um, they're going to have some restricted uh, abduction of the hip, so they're not going to move that uh, impacted leg as much. Treatment is pretty good if we catch this early on. If we can start them in a pavlet harness, which is this, we can do double diapering, which is wearing two diapers. Um, when older, then sometimes we have to use traction, casting mobilization. So this is an example of a spica cast. This would be a double, this is a single. Um, and this is not much fun. And then older kids, their outcomes are worse. It's, it's difficult to treat this, uh, but it might include um, going back to surgery, uh, operating, reducing this. It might be cutting some of the tendons or even cutting some of the bone and taking that out. So after the age of four, this is very difficult, but up until then, it's, it's kind of a minor thing. When you're working the spike of cast, make sure you want to keep it clean and dry. You pedal those sharp edges around the, the sides. With this bar here, do not use that to lift up your patients. Um, orthopedics will come unglued. Um, so you, you grab underneath the knees and grab underneath the, the shoulders and you lift. For club foot, this is congenital club foot. You're seeing an internal rotation of this. Um, procedure to replace this is called Ponsetti's, uh, Ponsetti procedure. What you're seeing is serial casting of it. And so you move those feet and then you put a cast on it to hold it in that position. And so it's constantly flying tra tra uh, traction on this and moving it outwards. And so you move it a little bit, cast it, let it you know, work for a couple of weeks, open up the cast, move the foot a little bit more, cast it. And so it's just kind of a series of getting these little casts on these little kids. Osteogenesis imperfecta is a host of different things, but this is a uh, inherited connective tissue disorder. And what you're seeing with this is excessive fragility and bone defects. Um, it's really popular in multiple TV shows and stuff like that. Less popular in real life. Um, but you still might see it. If uh, somebody's coming and they've got multiple fractures, this might be the cause. So it does impact the bone formation and causes uh, increased fractures. Some of the things that you might see on these patients would be an increase um, hyperextensibility of ligaments, so your double jointedness, uh, multiple fractures, and then you might see some blue sclera. Leg cap perthes disease. So this is a self-limited idiopathic disease that occurs um, usually in males between the ages of 2 and 10, 2 and 12, depending on who you ask. But basically, the head of the uh, the femoral head becomes a necrotic and avascular. So, what do we do with this one? It's it's bed rest. It's one of the few things that we say stay in bed, um, and then they come off of it, and there we just wait for it to reperfuse. Quite honestly, um, so treatment, pain management with this, keep that head in the acetabulum because they are at risk for having that pop out. Um, and just kind of manage it that way until they get circulation back to it. Skiffy or slip capital femoral epiphysis is um, when the ice cream cone comes off, when the ice cream goes off the cone, is the way I've heard it described. But you can kind of see the head of the femoral um, is, is not where it should be. It's not lined up like this. So what do we do with this one? So oftentimes we just put a screw into it and so it holds steady. 
So this may require surgery, um, and oftentimes there's bilateral involvement with this. Next one is scoliosis. I'm guessing that you've heard of this before, but this is a spinal def deformation. Um, basically, this is a curvature of the spine that, that is beyond normal, uh, and it's usually like a lateral or, or goes opposite of the way that we usually have our spine curve. More common in females, especially in teenager and preteens. Um, does have some impact on your ribs and on your lungs. Um, so you can kind of see here, like, these are some great examples of, of how that spine is. We can surgically correct it using titanium rods and lots of screws. Before we do this, oftentimes we'll use a TSLO. Um, this is um, sorry. Um, this is often not the case when you put on one of these on your patients is that they're smiling. Most of these girls are not smiling because it is uncomfortable. It is hot. It makes them look weird, um, and they're different. You know, it makes them look different than their peers. They have to wear it for about 20 hours out of the day. Um, so you can usually kind of take it off for showering, and that's about it. So most patients are not smiling like they are in the procedure, or in these pictures, sorry. Um, osteomyelitis, so this is infection of the bone and the bony tissue. So signs and symptoms, uh, pain, warmth, redness, um, increased white, white blood cells. You're going to see they'll do cultures on it and it will usually grow back like a staph aureus. Be careful, it might be methicillin resistant, so then that's the MRSA version. Um, you're going to do x-rays on this. Initial ones might seem normal, but subsequent ones you might see. Um, changes to that bone. So what do we do with this one? This is frequently giving antibiotics. This is going to be for um, a prolonged period of time. Uh, it says three weeks. It's usually four to six weeks is what I've commonly seen in practice. These patients are a really good candidate for pick lines for that long of IV therapy. Um, oral therapy doesn't get in the bones as well, so we do use IV therapy. And so just so you're aware of that, uh, we monitor them, you know, watch for all the signs and symptoms of infection and hopefully it gets better. If not, then we sometimes have to do surgery and that can include drawing, uh, drilling holes in the bone to get the infection out and letting it leak out. Um, and then in sealing some antibiotic during the surgery uh, to try and clear that up. Septic arthritis. So this is where the joints are warm, red, tender, swollen. Uh, this is usually a unilateral thing, um, as opposed to some bilateral things that we'll see later. Um, this is often related to traumatic injury. Um, this could be from getting pleated in soccer or some kind of a puncture type of situation. But they present with fever, leukocytosis, in increased uh, ESRs. Um, if they're sexually active uh, or even in infants, gonorrhea might be a cause. So. We do treat with antibiotics with this and watch them very closely. Um, tumors uh, do happen in children. We can talk about osteosarcomas and Ewing sarcomas. Um, tend to be male, um, especially in high rates of growth. So adolescence is one of those times that we see it the most. Um, for this, we can maybe do surgery and cut it out, cut around it. Um, we can do chemotherapy, we can do radiation. Um, rarely we have to amputate, but it is a possibility. JIA, this used to be called juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, but that's been changed. Um, this is an autoimmune disease, so something triggers it and the body acts against itself. Peak onset. Um, is one to three years. There's also it's often undiagnosed, uh, but the diagnosis often takes numerous uh, trips to the physician because it's usually not the first time that they come that they get diagnosed with this. Some signs and symptoms are pretty broad. It's arthritis, joint deformity, um, functional de deformity, um, 
can be some warmth, redness, swelling. Treatment, not NSAIDs. Uh, we can also give some meds like methotrexate uh, and uh, this one. Some steroids. Management, getting up and moving as much as possible, relieve the pain. Um, promote good general health as a whole. Encourage exercise and, and support them and their family. Lupus. So lupus is a chronic multi-system autoimmune disease. Um, it impacts the connective tissues and especially the blood vessels. So one of the main things with this is it's characterized by inflammation. This is more common in teenage females, more common in African American, Asian, and Hispanic children. And the symptoms are very, are variable, um, but may include cutaneous la lesions, so um, different skin rashes and stuff like that, lymphadenopathy. This butterfly rash here is kind of pathognomonic. If you ever see a butterfly rash or hear about that, think lupus. They can have nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, pain, generalized weakness, arthritis, joint pain, stiffness. Um, other things that they can have is renal failure, lung issues, um, like pleurisies, heart issues. So remember, since it's a blood vessel type of thing, those things that get a lot of blood are often at, at risk with this. Goals of treatment, supportive care, um, you know, treating with those meds that we talked about before. Um, minimize any exacerbations, make sure that we are trying to keep their stress low, that they're sleeping good, that they've got good nutrition and exercise. Uh, UVB light might help them in their skin uh, rashes, um, help them with therapy compliance, and really try and help them out with the body image concerns. Uh, most teenagers would not are not impressed with the butterfly rash, let alone any other rashes that they might get. All right, well, that concludes this um, discussion. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to contact your uh, professor.